Good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN AM for Wednesday, September 20th, 2023. And our top story today, the real reasons why food allergies are on the rise. Joining me now to discuss this and a lot more is Dr. Christopher Warren from Northwestern University. Chris, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. It's my pleasure. Um, so I want to talk about this study that you and the team conducted. Let's let's back up a little bit um, and talk about food allergies in general. When we, when we describe food allergies, what exactly are we talking about? Is it an upset stomach? Is it some allergic reaction that would would cause us to potentially be fatal? That is a, a very, very good question. And it's something to which, you know, there are actually a, a few different answers. I'll, I'll try to keep it simple. Um, but basically, there are a lot of different types of food allergies. The kind of food allergy that I think most people have in mind when they hear the term food allergy, especially when it's in combination with things like peanuts or shellfish or eggs, and the idea that, you know, you might need to carry epinephrine around to treat a, a severe anaphylactic reaction. Those are uh, the types of food allergies that, that our group has focused the most on. And also, I would say the most research has been done into those types of food allergies. And those are known kind of in the business as IgE mediated food allergies, because there's a particular antibody called IgE that is sort of the the driver of all these uh, different responses that that can happen when somebody who has a food allergy consumes that food or is otherwise exposed to that allergen, um, and then they have reaction symptoms, which for this type of allergy tend to be pretty rapid onset. You know, so in in minutes to up to a couple hours, but usually within a few minutes of eating a food that someone is uh, has one of these IgE mediated allergies they'll have symptoms like hives or, you know, swelling around where the, the food touched in the mouth. They might, um, you know, as the food makes its way into the, down into the gut, the proteins get, you know, digested and, and other parts of the immune system can then, um, or other, par other parts of the body are then exposed to those things. And then you have symptoms like, you know, you might vomit, you might have diarrhea, you, um, you know, might have trouble breathing, uh, you know, things like that. So so those are the types of symptoms that we really are very uh, alert for in somebody who has an allergy, because if you start experiencing symptoms like that, you could potentially be on your way to what we call anaphylaxis. And that is a very severe uh, type of reaction that can actually be life-threatening if not promptly treated with, with epinephrine um, and, and antihistamines can help as well, but really epinephrine is what you need uh, if you're experiencing anaphylaxis. Sure. And, and Chris, when it comes to these uh, these food allergies, are we seeing more prevalence of them in our society today? Yes, I, I think that that is definitely something that that our group has observed, and you know, to the extent that that we've got studies that have looked at the prevalence of different allergies over time, uh, over the past 20, 30 years, it really seems like there has been a, a real increase. You know, of course, there's also probably a greater chance of somebody being aware of allergies as they've kind of become more commonly discussed and more, uh, you know, now there are policies that are they're intended to try to help people with food allergies that are, you know, when you go to the pediatrician, they might advise you to try to actually do things to prevent food allergies. So that aspect, um, you know, is kind of happening in tandem where that we think there's a real rise in prevalence happening um, that's driven by, you know, changes in our environment, like broadly speaking. Um, but then also there's probably more and more people thinking they have food allergies, you know, whether they do or don't, just because it's a topic that's on everybody's mind. Yeah. And and what you, you mentioned, I think, an environmental reason, but why would, why would, allergies be on the rise, forgetting the awareness, because like with any malady, if 
people are talking about it in the media or people talking about it amongst friends, they, they might have some type of reaction where they believe they have that, as you yeah. indicated. But but why would we see a, a rise, assuming that it is a true allergy? Why would we see a rise in allergies, food allergies? Yeah. So so there are a number of different hypotheses, you know, that we data are are supporting. It's not one thing that's changed. There have been a, a lot of uh, a lot of things that have changed in our. Um, and when I say are, I mean the places where we see the highest rates of allergies are places like the United States, Australia, um, parts of Europe. Although uh, to some extent that is a function of those are the places we've been doing the studies to really look for them. We're starting to do studies to to try to figure out how many people globally all over the place are affected. And it does seem that particularly in urban areas, um, even in, in um, places like China, um, that there are they're also on the rise as well. Um, but but I think the most important uh, influence on on food allergies in particular appears to be related to the diets and how our diets have changed, um, particularly the ways that we we feed our infants. Um, we we know now um, with pretty good certainty that early and frequent exposure of uh, of these allergenic foods and particularly we're thinking there's they're the proteins because that's what you're uh, you know so like peanut protein like soy protein th those these little proteins that are in the muscles of shrimp uh you know those are the thing we don't really react to the whole shrimp or the whole nut we react to these proteins that are in there and so um, on one hand we've changed the ways that we process food where in the case of like peanuts, the particular way that that we and in, in the West like to eat our peanuts is like dry roasting them, which actually has an effect on the way the proteins are are uh, kind of structured and the way that our immune system interacts with them, as opposed to if you boil peanuts, that actually renders them a lot less likely to be um, you know be reacted to by your immune system. So there's we've we've changed the way we process these foods. We've also changed the the ways that we um, kind of systematically expose. Uh, our immune systems to these foods um, in really important ways. Um, so, you know, you can think about for many, 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 you know, millennia, the way that we probably fed our babies was, you know, making baby food by mom eating food, chewing it up, giving the little, you know, puree, whatever you call it, kind of mama bird style um, to the to the baby. And the babies were basically, they weren't eating baby food. They were just eating what the, uh, you know, once they they weaned off of breast milk, they were eating whatever foods that were in the adult diet. And uh, at that same time, adult diets weren't that variable. You know, if you think about, you know, up until pretty recently, it was, it would be very strange for somebody to, you know, in a three day weekend, eat Italian food, Asian food, uh, you know, American food, Northern European food, like food from literally all parts of the globe, all of which has these proteins that, you know, may or may not um, already be recognized by the immune system as something that is, uh, you know, friendly, innocuous, nutritious, uh, like, like food should be. Um, so we've learned a lot about the importance of feeding these allergens to infants um, early in their, uh, you know, in their development when their immune systems are kind of most likely to uh, treat that food as food and just treat it like it should and not have uh, these very maladaptive reactions to it. Um, at the same time, we're also coming to understand that while it is a little kind of strange to think about, um, the biggest predictor of whether or not a child develops food allergy is actually whether or not they have atopic dermatitis, or like a type of allergic eczema um, that's characterized by dry skin, inflamed skin, um, you know, a lot of itching. It can cover a little bit or a, or a lot of the child's body. And essentially, we've come to understand that um, because the way that your immune system first encounters these different proteins is so important in terms of figuring out whether or not it's going to treat that protein like a helpful, nutritious food or, you know, some pathogen that it needs to expel from the body through swelling or, or vomiting or, or all the characteristics of an allergic reaction, um, we now realize that it's kind of a, 
a race to expose the immune system through the through the mouth, through the gut by having the kids eat these foods compared to having the first uh, exposure to the foods happen through protein dust in the air, which is all around us. Like you think of the air being pretty much empty, but no, there's like millions of microbes and dust particles and things floating around. And it seems like a lot of these kids, when they have the inflamed skin, that peanut, if someone's eating peanut in the house, that dust is going in the air, it's landing on the kid's arm. And that's the first exposure that their immune system to these foods that starts this cascade of, uh, of uh, adverse immune reactions that tend to result in allergy. So we really think it's important not just to, to promote the early and kind of sustained feeding of these foods, but also make sure that um, the that eczema, which is also on the rise, um, is is treated, and uh, and that you're careful not to to what we call sensitize kids to to allergens through their skin. So so those are like kind of a couple of the major hypotheses. But clearly, I could go on and on and on about a lot of other ones. I'll let you. I want to I, I want to pick up on this. I want to I want to take a quick commercial break. We come back and we talk about how to treat and understand food allergies, you're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN AM. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses, I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Welcome back. We're joined this morning by Dr. Christopher Warren of Northwestern University. Chris, thanks so much for staying with us. Really appreciate you hanging around for segment number two this morning. So Chris, um, one of the things that I know we're talking about kids and, and kids uh, developing food allergies and the importance of, of exposing them for lack of a better term to some of these proteins in the food to get to build up the uh i don't know resistance i'm using lay terms here but yeah, I, tolerance I, I, we call it intolerance intolerance yeah. there you go resistance and tolerance, tolerance. Yeah. uh but let me ask you about um older adults because mm -hmm. i've heard about older adults people my age in my 50s 60s 70s suddenly becoming allergic to their environment suddenly becoming allergic to certain foods how prevalent is that? And, and why would something like that all of a sudden happen? Wow. Okay. Well, I, I have a good answer to the first question. The second question is, is very much uh, uh, something that we're looking into, um, but I ha we, have, we have some ideas. Um, so, so we did a big study a few years ago where we surveyed um, 40,000, well, over 50,000 households. We got data for about 40,000 adults and um, food out the prevalence of any food allergy in that group who was a, a nationally representative sample so we're pretty confident this reflects you know what's going on in the general u.s population um, but of these adults you know one in five said they had a food allergy um to my point earlier I, we thought we think that a lot of those people actually don't have food allergies they you know might have a, a related condition or an intolerance or, or something else that's that's resulting in symptoms that are real and and obviously can be burdensome but isn't the type of food allergy that I described where it's IgE mediated, 
they might be at risk of anaphylaxis and, and therefore needs to be managed like very um, you know carefully and intentionally. So when we really dug down into the numbers, we saw that um, you know about half of those people who said they had a food allergy, we we were unable to convince ourselves that they really did have a food allergy. Um, but that still leaves ten percent of U.S. adults with what we thought of as a true current food allergy. And a lot of those folks, about half had, had were actually allergic to multiple foods. Um, now digging in even, even deeper, when you look at when those food allergies uh, came on or when they started, about half of adults had at least one of these food allergies that they said started during adulthood. So, so that is a, a very substantial number of adults who you know, may have gone their whole life eating shrimp here and there. And then all of a sudden, you know, one scampy later, they're, they're having a, a really rough time. And so that is, interestingly enough, it's a different sort of question than, than why do, uh, you know, why does a kid develop food allergies? Because for a baby, their immune system's never seen the food before, or it's only seen the food in the form of like a protein that floated around, got in through their inflamed skin, and their immune system said, no way, that that's why would I want that in my body? It's like floating around in the air and coming in through my inflamed skin. That's probably the sign of something that's bad, you know, as opposed to something that's accompanied by all the different uh, nutrients and and things that and fibers and things that that help our body when you eat something, you know, that the whole way down, it's signaling to all your little microbes and, and uh, cells that this is a good thing for my body. I, I want to keep this in here. I want to extract all the nutrition and process it. Um, so I think there's a, there's a different dynamic happening in adults where systems already learned that it's learned that 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 shrimp protein is fine and it's you know been exposed here and there and then at some point that that connection between the shrimp protein and it being a you know something that is that is innocuous if not helpful and nutritious that tolerance is broken and so um that's what we're really trying to figure out is like what are the factors that lead to that tolerance like once it's established um to be to be broken. And so one of the things we think helps maintain tolerance to these foods is just is regular exposure, you know, in forms that we have as a species like traditionally consumed these foods, you know, so so minimally processed forms and and you know relatively frequent consumption. So your immune system kind of doesn't forget that, oh, actually this shrimp is is fine. Um, you know, it, and and we like it when when this enters the body through the normal uh, you know gut route. So the other thing that you know, that I find really fascinating that we've been doing some our, our our extended research group has been doing a lot of work on is trying to understand the link between because um, a lot of people um, we've we've got we've got a lot of people who have allergies to things like dust mites and pollens and cockroaches like things that are you know in the house or out in the environment want because uh if as <laughs> it's sort of gross to think about but if you look at a dust mite under a microscope um or a cockroach you know under a microscope and you put that head to head with some crustacean shellfish uh they don't look that different um, and part of that is because they're made of the same stuff. You know, a lot of the the proteins that that help the the cockroaches and dust mites, you know, legs work, are the same proteins that are in the shrimp that help them move around. And like I mentioned before, we're not allergic to the whole shrimp. We're just allergic to that little muscle protein. Um, and that particular protein is called tropomyosin. And that same protein is what our immune system reacts to when we're allergic to dust mites or cockroaches. So, and they're also in different types of finned fish as well. So we, what we think is going on with a fair number of adults who develop these shellfish allergies is that, you know, they've developed a, an allergy to dust mites or cockroaches because those are very allergenic and they're in the house and, and they're, you know, usually in very high concentrations um, and you get sensitized through the lungs, um, which is a very potent way to, you know, kind of expose your immune system to something. But then your immune system sees that that same protein in a shrimp leg eventually and and starts to get confused. It's like, well, wait, but this is bad because I'm because I, I'm used to reacting to this this thing when I see it in a dust mite or when I see it in a cockroach. So we think for a lot of these adults who are developing 
um, adult onset shellfish allergy, which is by far the most common type of adult onset allergy, that that is that is likely the process that's driving some of this um, allergy, at least in some patients. And Chris, just to kind of wrap it up, because um, we could spend hours and hours talking about this, it's an important topic, but do we need to shop differently? Do we need to buy different foods or is it we need to do more and eat, continue the diversity within the diet? I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you come at this if you got a great, a greater prevalence of it? Um, and some of it's environmental, some of it may be a result of production. Um, mm -hmm. What do you do? Do you, do you, do you buy different foods or do you, do you, you keep diversifying what you eat? Yeah, well, well, I can tell you what I'm doing. You know, I, I have a, a four month old daughter who I think this week we're going to start introducing, you know, solid foods to her. And, and you know, I, we're my family's always thinking about how to how to be healthy and stay allergy free. And, and I, I think the it really comes down to, you know, not making dramatic changes, but just trying to think about, you know, when you're exposing things to your body, is this something that, you know, my body and bodies like mine, you know, from our, in our ancestors is going to recognize as food. <laughs> you know, I think a lot of the things I think, especially when I was a teenager, you know, that I was eating all these like hyper processed foods. It's like, if you showed that to someone in the 1700s, like a Cheeto, they wouldn't necessarily identify that as food, you know, like, so I think generally just eating, trying to lean towards a, you know, a whole more whole food based diet, cutting down on the processed foods and making sure that um, you are exposing your body to, to a diverse diet. Um, and not just like once a year, but kind of incorporating that dietary diversity um, in, into your, into your life. It, it not only makes, you know, your mealtime more interesting um, and, and might prevent allergies, but it's also generally a healthier way to, you know, live. And it, and it tends to also, be have positive effects on other health outcomes, you know, like obesity, like your cardiovascular system. So um, luckily there, there might be a lot of kind of, you know, bang for your buck with going, going that route. Um, yeah. So that's yeah, my that, basic advice. Nothing, yeah, nothing. No, I, think, and I think that, yeah, I think that's great advice. And I think, you know, it, it all kind of ties in together because what you put in your mouth goes into your body becomes part of your body, right? I mean, it all gets filtered through. So you want to you want to fuel it with the right food possible. Chris, we're going to have to leave it there. Great to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining us. And we look forward to having you back on the program again very soon. Yeah, be happy to. Thanks so much. That wraps up this episode of BRNAM. Have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to, drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the latest curated news and lifestyle wellness, finance, tech, so much more, all in one place, check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Bulls. Want to search our archives, check out our latest content, then visit our website. We're back again tomorrow with another edition of BRNAM. I'll have a very special guest. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Now is your opportunity to co-create content around any topic on the first lifestyle and wellness network. Reach a global audience through our platform and co-own exclusive branded content. All of our programs are available on demand and also as audio only podcasts so you can take us on the go. Broadcast Retirement Network, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device.